stage, President and CEO of the Consumer Electronic Association, Gary Shapiro. Welcome to the 2012 Entertainment Matters program at CES, sponsored by Variety and Ericsson. Our associate sponsor is the Screen Actors Guild. Back for a second year, Entertainment Matters at CES is designed for Hollywood's film, television, and digital communities and entertainment professionals interested in the convergence of content and technology. Of course, you know, the entertainment industry is evolving. And we're still going to movie theaters and buying TVs, but there's a connective thread that's bringing all of these experiences together and bringing entertainment to people whenever they want, wherever they are. The internet is creating exciting opportunities, of course, for the entertainment industry. And YouTube is proving that producers, curators, advertisers, brands, and viewers can all thrive in this ecosystem. If you have a classic TV series, a new movie, an interactive commercial, or almost any video, YouTube connects with viewers in new ways. This innovative company was founded in 2005 and has dramatically changed the entertainment marketplace. Today, 98 of Ad Age's top 100 advertisers have run campaigns on YouTube. YouTube is helping content creators monetize the more than 3 billion videos that are viewed each week on its global platform. The company believes that there's tremendous opportunity for the web as a distribution vehicle. YouTube is pr proving that producers, curators, and brands can reach large global audiences and engage viewers. To talk about this changing ecosystem and what it means for our industry, we are delighted to be joined today by YouTube's Robert Kinsel, Vice President of Global Content. Robert is driving force in bringing more entertainment to YouTube. He arrived at YouTube from Netflix just over a year ago to help Google's video site reach out to Hollywood. He'll also be joined by a few YouTube friends on stage to talk about how new opportunities for viewers, entertainers, and brands. Here you go, ladies and gentlemen. Please join me in welcoming Robert Kinsel to present the Entertainment Matters keynote address. This may come in handy. Well, welcome, and thank you, Gary. If you're like me, you've come to see us to shop at Barney's because the sales are wonderful these days. <laughs> but I'm sure most of you have come here to see what all of our wonderful consumer electronic partners have in store for the coming year and the years after with all the wonderful connected devices that power the services that we provide, that distribute the content that many of you provide, and most importantly, that delight the consumers worldwide. Speaking of delight, let me tell you a little story about one of the wonderful rising stars on YouTube called Michelle Pham. Michelle grew up together with her mother running a beauty, shop, a beauty, uh, beauty parlor. Her mother, just like every other good mother, including my own, wanted her to become a doctor. <laughs> Michelle wouldn't have that. She followed her passion, she followed her mother's passion, and she started to create instructional and makeup videos on YouTube and has created when it's one of the most successful channels on YouTube. Now, smart and innovative brand builders at L'Oreal have noticed 
and Michelle ended up with a great sponsorship from Lancome. It's a wonderful, wonderful, magical story that would not have been possible five years ago, that it's absolutely possible today. Now you may say, well, Michelle may be successful on YouTube, but how would she stack on television? Well, Style Network, which is a cable channel focused on the same type of an audience that Michelle is focusing on, has had record ratings on some of their shows in Q3 of last year. They've reached more than 700,000 viewers on their episodes. At the same time, Michelle has reached twice the audience on her channel. This is today on YouTube, just a few years after YouTube has been created. Massive amount of audiences focused on certain topics, certain genres are aggregating and coming and being delighted by wonderful, wonderful content creators such as Michelle. Now you may say, well, is she the only one? And I say, well, there are a few more. Top five of YouTube, top five YouTube channels, channels such as Vivo, Machinima, if you look at their viewership numbers and the amount of reach that they have, they would stack rank in top 20 cable channels on television. It's a wonderful success, and all of these channels are only getting started. They are just scratching the surface of what's possible and what's possible on a domestic level and what's possible on a global level. Now, how did we get here? Over the last 30 years, we've seen tremendous transformation of the video industry. Early in the 70s and 80s, there were four channels on television. They commanded 100% of all the viewership. Then cable, satellite, and a telco came around, and they gave birth to hundreds of niche channels. And all of those channels today command more than 75% of all viewership that takes place on television. It's unbelievable testament to the fact that people like to consume around niches, and their audience is fragmenting, and more and more of them are moving to consume on wonderful cable channels today. Now, what does that mean for all of us? With the rise of the internet and the speed of the internet? Now, we believe, and I just underscore the word believe, we don't have the proof, but we believe that by 2020, 75% of all channels, be it the existing channels on television and be it many new channels being created, such as the one that Michelle Fan has created, will be transmitted and will be born on the internet. And that's an incredibly powerful thought when you think about that 10 years ago, you could barely view a page on the internet. Dial up, just, just pause and think about what's been happening over the last 10 years and the speed of things and the way they're developing. So this is all possible because a closed system is now opening up and many talented creators and human creativity is unleashed, and audiences worldwide are delighted. Now, when I talk about delight, I'm talking about professionals. There's a tremendous amount of talent in Hollywood, in New York, in London, in Bollywood, all over the world, and all of those creators have been creating for television and theaters, for all of the platforms that we're used to. But with the rise of internet penetration into all kinds of devices, Amateurs, semi-pros, aspiring filmmakers now can all create with incredibly cheap cameras, instant video, and you know what? You can do it with your own little phone. Beautiful Samsung Nexus phone can create videos that you upload and you delight viewers worldwide. All of that is happening today and it's happening on the internet and a lot of it is happening on YouTube. Take an example. There are 17 million yoga enthusiasts in the United States. You can double it for the whole world. I dare you to find a channel anywhere in the world on television that would reach that audience. I can guarantee you that within a year or two, you will find a wonderful, wonderful yoga channel on YouTube, delighting viewers on a global basis and providing smart brand builders and innovative brand builders a reach to an audience that is incredibly targeted and incredibly passionate and incredibly delighted. It's a magical moment. It's wonderful what's happening today. And it's not happening just on PCs. When I talk about online video, it doesn't mean computers. You all know that. It means a lot of different devices. 
tablets, phones, all of those devices in your pockets right now. Some of you may be watching a video on your tablet right now, not caring about the speech. It's all happening, and it's wonderful. We all love it. But what all of these devices have in common is that they are interactive. What they lend themselves to is this concept of sharing, concept of commenting, concept of you know, creating parodies, just an incredible engagement of viewers with the video that we provide them. Just unbelievable unleashing of human creativity that again delights viewers worldwide and continues to do that at an incredible pace. Now, I'm gonna probably mess this up, but I'm gonna try anyway. <laughs> there are over 100,000 years worth of video viewed on Facebook, and this is YouTube videos, viewed on Facebook every single year. And it's growing very rapidly. There are 350 million videos, YouTube videos, shared on Twitter every single year. And it's growing incredibly rapidly. I don't know if these numbers are big. Anyone that I ask, they tell me they're huge. But they continue to rise, and whatever was huge last year, uh, or is huge today, it seems really tiny 12 months later. It's an unprecedented rate of growth for all of us in online video. Now, there are a lot of smart brand builders harnessing the power of the internet and harnessing the power of innovation and human creation. Take Coke. They've created wonderful, wonderful ads and a lot of them were placed on YouTube to see what traction they would get. And they got 30 million views on the ads they've created and uploaded. It's an unbelievable reach, unbelievable engagement, unbelievable exposure. And then some smart person at that company said, this is YouTube. Why don't we let some of those people create ads for us? Let's see what, that, what they'll come up with. Maybe they will be incredibly creative and come up with something smarter than we might have. Who knows? They've done it. They engaged the YouTube audience. And over a very short period of time, they received 120 million views on user-created commercials, all involving the Coke brand. Unbelievable, unbelievable. Fans are so engaged. The engagement with the brand was just off the charts. And kudos to Coke for doing this. Let me, uh, let me show you a little snippet of one of those. Like the movies? I don't know. I mean, why do we always have to see the kind of movies you want to see? What is wrong with action movies? Well, would it hurt you to see a romantic comedy? That's all I'm saying. Hey! Somebody stop that guy! Think 10 years back, just pause, 10 years back, not even 10, five. This wasn't possible. This wasn't possible because the platform wasn't there. This wasn't possible because advertisers weren't there. This simply wasn't possible. The audience wasn't there. And now it is. And it's happening. And it's growing incredibly rapidly. I'm speaking of speed. What happened in 30 years on cable, happens in 10 years with broadband, happens in five years in online video. The speed at which we're running is incredible. And when I say we, I don't mean just Google, I don't mean just YouTube, I mean everyone in the internet space, and I mean especially everyone in the online video space. The speed is just tremendous, and we're all just powered by the delight of our consumers. Take a look at this chart, amazing. These are not our stats, industry statistics. Within just a few years, online video will be responsible for 90% of all internet traffic. 90%, just think about that. Just think about what it powers. It's unbelievable. When I talk about online video, I'm not talking about computers alone. I'm talking about smart TVs, all of you here at CES, are seeing the wonderful products that Samsung, LG, Sony, Toshiba, 
all of those friends in our space are creating, and they're making their TVs just so wonderful, so smart, interacting with our services and a lot more new content. 500 million of those will be shipped by 2015. 500 million. Think about that. Mobile devices, again, all of you have them right here on you. Over 700 million mobile devices will be enabled, activated and enabled, so not just sold, but activated by the end of this year. An unbelievable number. All of them connected to the internet, all of them capable of displaying online video. One fun statistic, there are more Android activation every single day than babies born on Earth. <laughs> Andy Rubin, who runs our mobile business, is incredibly delighted, and he's looking at other planets to find customers because he's running out. <laughs> it's, it's just mind-boggling what's happening in mobile. It's unbelievable. Our own usage is just surpassing all of our expectations, and we constantly have to reforecast, unfortunately. <laughs> Why am I talking about mobile? Not just the speed. The speed is amazing, the connectivity is amazing, but there are also very close parallels in what's happening in the App Store and what we believe will happen in the online video space. The App Store has hundreds of thousands of apps, hundreds of thousands of brands, existing and new, allowing us all interact and do a lot of different fun things. On the average, and you can all look in your pockets and look at your phones, you probably have somewhere between 30 to 50 applications installed on your phone. And those are the ones that you interact with. Now think about your TV consumption habits. There are hundreds of channels, in some places thousands. You roughly, on the average, interact with about 20 of those. So the interaction with a number of brands, number of content aggregators, number of content provided to you, is going up on an open platform. 40 apps, unbelievable. What apps also uh, have in common with video is that they are incredibly, incredibly delightful. And apps are mashable, they can be shared, they're immersive, they're instant, and they're on all the time. And when you think about all of these words over here on the screen, all of those words, you can just swap out the phone for online video, and it's exactly the same thing. The, the human creativity that unleashed hundreds of thousands of apps it's the same human creativity that will unleash hundreds of thousands of new pieces of content organized into wonderful channels, such as the yoga example that I mentioned, such as Michelle Fan's channel, that will delight users worldwide. Now, four years ago, or three years ago, when Steve Jobs announced the, uh, the, the creation of the App Store, John Doerr, famous venture capitalist stood on stage with him and announced the creation of the iFund, which meant to spur the creativity of the app developer world, and it absolutely has succeeded. It's done incredible things. And when you think about what Google and YouTube have done over the last 12 months, we've done exactly the same thing. Our developers are not software engineers. Our developers are Hollywood stars, our online stars, regular folks like you and I, we've catalyzed the community to come and create around a lot of interesting topics, a lot of interesting niches that can delight users worldwide. And it's an ex incredibly exciting thing, and we're only getting started. Now, we haven't just worked on content. We also started to look at the way users interact with YouTube and started to think about the organizing principles that we can introduce that will help them follow and subscribe to all of these wonderful new channels that are being created. And as you might have seen in our redesign of the YouTube product that was launched in December, we've done a pretty great job. Our entire engineering organization and product organization is just getting started on all the wonderful changes that they will bring to our users on TVs, tablets, phones, PCs, any device that has a screen and internet connectivity. We're only getting started, but we're incredibly serious about the organizing principles that can further delight 
our viewers worldwide. I remember Michelle. She is one of the faces of YouTube. She's one of the faces of Lancome. She's one of the faces of what's happening in the internet video. She took her passion and just propelled herself into a stardom and into an incredible following of many users that are delighted by her work every single day. Now, would this be possible five years ago? Absolutely not. Five years ago, there was no Netflix streaming. Five years ago, there was no Hulu streaming. Five years ago, there was no March Madness on the internet. Life was pretty boring. <laughs> Today, Netflix streams over two billion hours per quarter, an unbelievable number. Hulu has more than 30 million uniques on their property, an unbelievable number. And CBS, growing 60% year over year in their usage of March Madness online, at 50 million viewers on it just last year. I mean, just, just pause, think five years. Where were you five years ago? What were you doing if you were not doing this? And then, of course, there's a little known property called YouTube, with just 800 million users showing up on a monthly basis and consuming more than 3 billion hours per month. 3 billion. That's, that's a lot. <laughs> It essentially means 30 minutes for every human on Earth, <laughs> which is a lot. And they are just getting started just like we are. So we invite you, whether you're a content creator, whether you're a content aggregator, whether you're a brand builder, but most importantly, if you're a viewer, to come and join us and play in online video because it's not happening tomorrow, it's happening today. And if you want to innovate, and if you want to have fun, and if you want to build a really robust business, the time to join us is now. Come and play. Thank you. Now, to give you a little teaser on what's coming on YouTube in 2012, I'll play a little video, and you can see some of the wonderful creators who are coming to join us already, and they have come and joined us. Here we go. Hi there, I'm Stan Lee. Ben Silverman. Rain Wilson. Felicia Day here. Sat the Sorrell. I'm Deepak Chopra. I'm Anthony Zucker. Hi, I'm Brooke Burke Charvet. Baron Davis. We're going to have this awesome channel. We want it to be thought provoking, creative. From comics to board games to video games, horror and thriller and sci fi. Your favorite sports figures. For health and well being, love, relationship, scripted comedy, and reality. The Tween Clubhouse on YouTube. YouTube is the place where people already go. With their hundreds and millions of, of viewers. And they're able to reach this massive audience worldwide. You've got a base right there that can, they can write their comments, they can engage with the video. There's something wonderful about instantly have people give you feedback. And it's going to distinguish YouTube from all the other platforms. So incredibly far reaching, instantaneous. It goes to your phone, it goes to your office, it goes to your laptop, it goes to your home computer. The days of linear media are changing and changing fast. The immediacy of being able to have an idea or identifying a piece of talent and just try it. This is a platform for artistry. Creativity. Fresh, cool, and hip stuff. Just thinking differently. Unfiltered. A spark of imagination that can be blown up into a mass hit. It's a call for those who want to be at the forefront of what's going on next. This is only the beginning of something really, really special. It's, it's, it's wonderful, and we're truly blessed that all of these folks choose to work with us and create for us. So now, let me spend the rest of the time by inviting a few of those folks on stage and tell you about their experiences with the tailwinds of online video. We close the video with Anthony Zeicher, uh, for those of you who may not know him, he's the creator of all of the CSI franchises, one of the biggest ho Hollywood producers there is. And Anthony created, obviously, the first franchise, uh, CSI franchise, in Las Vegas. So we figured uh, if nobody can bring him back, it must be YouTube back to Vegas. So Anthony, uh, creator of CSI. Michael Casson, CEO of MediaLink. 
Alan Debevoix, CEO of Machinima, one of the largest channels on YouTube. Rob Norman of Group M, to talk about what it means to advertisers and all of the brands. Lucas Watson, who has to make sure inside Google that all of this gets paid for. <laughs> and Peter De Luca from T-Mobile. This is a great group of folks, all of whom play an enormous role in what we all do and allow all the innovation and creativity and delight happen. Thank you. Take it away, Michael. Thank you, Robert. And, and speaking about passion, I think, uh, I think it came clear uh, from what you just heard and saw that Robert, at, at the head of this, is passionate about what's happening at YouTube, but passionate really about a revolution. And it's not happening in an evolutionary way, it's happening in a revolutionary way. So it's exciting to be part of this movement and be part of this moment. So uh, when I was thinking about this morning and uh, getting ready to chat with some of the brightest and most important people in the industry, I did what you do when you prepare for something like this. I went online, I went on Google, I took a look, and I found USA Today sent me there talking about YouTube redefining TV with a $100 million plan. So thinking that we're in Las Vegas, I thought we would take a shot, put $100 million on the hard eight, and see what happens. So I don't know. Plays eight to one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So uh, eight to one. Speaking of that, Anthony, I'd love to start with you. Sure. Um, I told you backstage, you, you changed my life because my wife became addicted to 10 o'clock, and it's all your fault. So you know, on a personal level, we have to have a conversation about it. But, but all kidding aside, um, you did create, <clears throat> if not the most successful, certainly one of the most successful franchises in the history of entertainment, not just television, but in the history of entertainment and really changed the face of entertainment. And here you are, as Robert said, back in Las Vegas uh, and, and you know, announcing something that's very exciting. When we chatted, we talked about democratization and other things, but I guess at, at, at the base of it, why? I mean, you, you know, you, you've apparently made a few shekels along the way, uh, and, and, and here you are back in Las Vegas at, at the dawn of a new era. Well, first and foremost, uh, it's great to be home in Vegas, so welcome everybody to our home. Uh, you know, CSI was a phenomenon, and we changed the course of television through CSI. But at the core of what's in our hearts for our company in black box television really is storytelling. So, so we saw the future of TV you know, in CSI in 2000, and now we see the future of storytelling really through Google and YouTube. And to have the chance to tell stories in terms of a categorical niche under the auspice of a scalable umbrella such as Google turns this into not only the future of entertainment, but possibly the extinction of TV as we know it. And when, and when you say extinction, do you think that the consumer, and, and, and at the end of the day it's about the consumer, do you think the consumer really is concerned with definition of television or viewing content on, on, on whatever device they want to view it? Well, ironically, based on, you know, we are in the uh, a technological revolution wrapped at the, you know, inside of a, a time where storytelling is at its highest point. But television gives you that absorption uh, experience, and Google through YouTube is offering an interactive experience, so it's different. And I, I, and I believe that the, the consciousness of the technology has conditioned us to now consume content in a way to where it is interactive, whether we're playing Angry Birds on the tablet or whether we're consuming things on a laptop or our mobile phone. So the behavior has already shifted so now we are actually catching up by doing content in the future through YouTube and Google to match those behaviors and scaling it all around the world. And this is just the very beginning. So it's a historic moment for all of us on the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Lucas, um, you spent 17 years at Procter & Gamble. And you know, we all know that that's, that's an important place to, to start your career and, and, and 17 years uh, being part of the largest marketer in the world. I think the last time I checked, uh, the numbers, it was somewhere around $11 billion of marketing spend at, at, at Procter & Gamble. It's, 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 quite a, it's quite a number. But here you are now on the other side of the table, and you know, we always talked about lean back and lean in. You know, buyers and sellers, the difference about lean in and lean back, forget the device. But you're now in a position where you're looking at the marketers and, and trying to 
make sense out of this because the numbers are there. How do you, as, as a marketer at heart, you know, discuss this with your, your brethren now on the other side of the table to make sense out of all of this in terms of numbers because metrics, accountability, and, and the ROI that a marketer needs to get are still at the core. So how have you been able to transition that conversation? I, I think um, that most people recognize that uh, the consumer behavior is there. Uh, but they've struggled to come up with a framework and an understanding of how to think about online video as part of their brand building mix. Uh, but I will tell you that with the advent of uh, folks like Anthony and Alan coming to YouTube uh, and the redesign of YouTube around the construct of channels uh, has allowed people to use some frameworks that they're comfortable with in the world of buying advertising on television uh, and recognizing some areas of familiarity that have given them permission to try. And at the same time, uh, the things that we referenced uh, with YouTube in terms of its interactivity, the ability to uh, share and pass along, whether it be content or brands uh, that you love and you know, uh, and the intersection of both the social graph uh, and the content and video, um, people are starting to recognize uh, that it gives you a lot of the benefits that you've always loved from Sight, Sound, and Motion with a whole bunch of extra stuff you can do where people can participate uh, in the creation of brands. And uh, I can tell you that the energy and the excitement that we felt this week at CES with a lot of our partners uh, has been intense. And I think we're on the steep part of the curve. So it's, it's an exciting time to be a part of it. And, and, and are, the marketers, are the marketers understanding the, the transition? I mean, th there's excitement, there's a lot of heat and, 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 and well-deserved, but are the, are the marketers understanding how to look at this versus how they looked at conventional television sure. historically? I think just like anything else, you have some early adopters, right? A lot of the media and entertainment partners that we have uh, have been great adopters of YouTube very early on. Uh, our our uh, technology partners like Peter from T-Mobile have been great. Um, and, but what this conversation has done, the construct of channels and the launch of all the new original programming uh, has really opened up the discussion uh, with consumer products, with healthcare, with auto, uh, and maybe some of the folks that um, uh, are in the next stage of adoption. Uh, and just like anything else, there's some folks that are skeptical, um, but that's what makes it fun and exciting. So, uh, Alan, let me, let, me, let me turn to you. Um, Machinima is, is quite an extraordinary story, and you know, I'm proud that we've had the chance to work together over the years and right. watch, it, watch it happen, but it's really an unprecedented success. I mean, I think the numbers bear out that you're the most successful channel other than music right now, and pretty damn close in terms of music right. uh, on, on YouTube. And it, my, my question is sort of, you snuck up on everybody. All of a sudden, there was this machinima, right. and, and, and all of a sudden, the numbers are extraordinary, and just hundreds of millions of, of interactions uh, you know, on a daily basis. Did you, did you expect that? I mean, let me, let me start with that. <clears throat> well, I know, actually, we didn't, and, and there's a number of things that really uh, led to it, but you know, we're, we're delivering about 1.1 billion video views per month to about 116 million people around the world. And we're a programming brand inside the, of YouTube, uh, and we think of ourselves as sort of part of what I would call the third wave of video programming, where the broadcasters were the first wave and the, tech, and the cable networks were the second wave, and companies like us and Vivo and some of the other networks are the third wave. And there's two real factors that are causing it, and they're both really part of the YouTube platform. One is that every network, every channel that goes up on YouTube is instantly global. And as you know, in the cable business, to actually get distribution, even in the United States, and to actually get global, it would take you decades to do that. And then the second factor, of course, is the proliferation of devices. You know, in the, and we used to talk about the cable business, 100 million homes pass in the United States. But we think about it as a billion devices, because people watch Machinima videos at home, at the office, at school, and then on all the devices that they actually have. So now you have a billion devices in the US alone that are really talking to, uh, and can, can really play video, and is creating a crazy amount of scale. I mean, you know, Robert was talking about the idea of speed, and really in the last 20 months or 24 months, we have seen just enormous growth, you know, and it's really a real tribute to the platform. So, so speaking about that and speaking about platforms, Rob, you know, you oversee an awful lot of media uh, investment on behalf of clients across, uh, across your brands within Group M and, and you know, 
billions and billions of dollars, you know, on a global basis, silliness, but, you know, 80 billion or something. But in terms of, you know, North America, where your purview is, uh, it's multiple billions of dollars. And, and moving that money and, and investing that money on your client's behalf has never been easy. But uh, I think it's probably as, well, easy for me to say. That's right. But, but, but truly, um, the complexity that you have today as an investment advisor, I more than anything with your, with your clients, um, lots of people are knocking on your door saying, we want to get some of those TV dollars because that's where the gold is. And, and, and I guess my question is, how are you looking at that from a, a, you know, as a buyer but as a, a strategist and as an investment advisor, as I say, for your clients? I do love the simplicity of your questions, <laughs> always. Um, it's because I make them up as I go along. Yeah, self-evidently. Uh, um, I answer them myself halfway through. So, of course, if you're, <coughs> if you're English of a certain age, then you'll know that the English always objected to the idea of television, um, not because of its entertainment quality or usability, but because it was a compound word that came from Greek and Latin, and they objected to it on that basis. Um, so... So I've tried to bring that kind of thinking to the business um, in North America. And I think that our view of the world now is that there are video experiences. And those video experiences are delivered in different formats. And we haven't talked about the fact of the length of the programming and the ad load in programming. And I think that's a highly significant area. But it's absolutely self-evident that the advertiser will follow user attention and user engagement, and will only qualify that by the potential for the advertising to stand out within that context. And one of the interesting parts about this edifice being built on the Google ecosystem, not just the YouTube ecosystem, is that it provides data sets that prove out some of those things in a way we've never really experienced um, with television as we've understood it before. So there's no question that we're seeing a rapid migration. Um, there's no question that against younger target audiences, particularly, that migration accelerates more quickly. But there are still a number of significant unknowns out there, which is what the role of advertising is in program formats of radically different lengths in particular, and about the degree to which the advertising within programming of different lengths is interruptive rather than previous to it. So we have a, a great deal to learn, but we're fortunate in the success of, 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 of Google, of course, and in other partners of at least being able to read and see this. The other challenge for advertisers, I'm sure we're going to get to um, in a second, is that there's a Darwinian quality about all of this. So YouTube announces they're going to launch 100 new channels of original content. And right now, today, they have an even chance of succeeding, theoretically. When it plays out over the next few months, some of them will succeed very, very well. Some of them will fail horribly. For advertisers, they also know that one of the things I'm sure you do is you go and search for your own ads on YouTube. And you know for sure that if no one is looking at your ads in YouTube and you search them, then there's something wrong with the advertising. So I'm looking forward to this kind of Darwinian play out of this game. Well, and, and I, that's a great transition. Thanks, Rob. Because, um, you know, Peter, at the end of the day, the investment here from a marketer standpoint is yours. And, and you know, the, the, the advice that you get from your agency partners and, and from the strategy that you put forth, you still have to look at where you're gonna spend your money and get the, that return. Do you feel as a marketer that in, in the online marketplace, you're getting what you expect based on the metrics, based on the accountability and, and, and the feedback loop that Rob just alluded to, because again, he's right. If, you're, if, if people aren't watching it there, they're probably not reacting to it no matter what platform. Absolutely. Uh, you know, it's complicated to be, to be very serious, and we take a very broad strategy. I mean, we believe video crosses lots of platforms, and when we look at the metrics of how we use it uh, online, we sort of use it all the way through our, our purchase funnel, at the top of the funnel for generating broad-scale awareness, and I mean, just the scale of YouTube alone 
gives us that sort of aspect. But as you move to the more of the consideration side, getting people to be able to see demos about your products and services or creating amazing 4G experiences like what we try to do on our mobile devices and being able to let them view them on YouTube it's a pretty compelling way. And then through the scale of just Google in general, being able to retarget our message uh, through the Google ad networks, that's where you really see the whole thing actually coming all the way through the funnel. So we, we definitely believe our strategy is working quite well. And, and, and so let me, let me turn back to Anthony because you know, this is one of those watershed moments. So 10, 12 years ago, we talked a lot about um, Madison and Vine. And we talked about the marketers and the content creators coming together you know, earlier in the process and, and, and having a conversation that would get us away from bolted on sort of stilted product placement and product integration. As you're creating for this platform, Anthony, are you open to an earlier discussion with Peter or do you still think of Peter, and I know you didn't say this personally, but is Peter just the ATM that, you know, you put the, the credit card in, you take the money out, or are you willing to listen to his thinking as it relates to your programming to, 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 you know, capture some of his strategic imperatives. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, the thing about the power of scale. There's a deal being made right here, I <laughs> want you all to be aware. The power of scale and the power of storytelling and the power of relationship that you have with your audience, especially in the YouTube format, where you can interact with them and create content. We understand that there's millions and millions of dollars on the sidelines in the currently broken TV model. It's hard to sell a six-year-old and a 60-year-old the same can of beer. But in this situation, <laughs> but in categorical niche... Is that a, is that a view into what we're going to be seeing? Yeah. <laughs> but in categorical niche, meaning it's, you know, specific channels targeted to specific audiences with an undying loyalty of storytelling, it makes the relationship between the content creator and the advertiser much more symmetrical. Because you can have an, an honest dialogue and conversation about how to not only champion the product of where the money's coming from, but also do it in a way to not damage the integrity of the storytelling. Whereas in the previous model on television, it's always like zoom in on the uh, battery, zoom in on the product placement, and it, it, it takes you out of the experience. And we have to have a level of respect to where advertisers respect how we tell stories, and we respect how to sell their products and make it seem uh, imperceptible in the storytelling so everybody's happy. And so, thank you. So, so Lucas, um, Channel conflict. Let's talk about channel con conflict for a second in a different way than you might think. It's still at the end of the day going to be about the quality of the content that people are viewing and, and, and creating a, a, a habituation. I mean, I think that's at the, at the heart of this is to get people to, we'll never have appointment television again, and I think that's, that's a thing of the past. People set their own calendars now and have for a long time, but as, as we try to look at this as a channel separate and apart, really I think the, the, the perfect day for you and, and YouTube would be for it not to be viewed as a channel apart or a channel conflict, but a channel of entertainment and a place where people start to habituate, forget when they watch it, but you know, where they're going to see it. Um, absolutely, I mean, I, I think uh, two things to think about. Number one is, uh, it should, it, it's the content. You're gonna be, you know, a billion devices in the US, but ultimately, if you listen to Mary Meeker and she says there's gonna be 10 billion internet connected devices, you know, by the time we're all said and done here on the planet, um, uh, it's gonna be the way you're gonna have access to entertainment. And uh, unlike maybe in the television model where at eight o'clock on Thursday night, you know, uh, Friends has five weeks to make it, and if they don't make it, you know, we pull that show and we put another one on, um, I think this, uh, YouTube provides the opportunity, one, um, to be more accessible to the audience because you can watch it whenever you want. Uh, and two, you can take the time to develop your audience over time. I mean, it hasn't even taken that long, but Alan has a very loyal following on Mashimina, and if he wants to launch a new show, he's already got an installed base that through the social graph, he can connect with and, and build uh, an audience for his new show based off the back of his old shows. Uh, and because it's a very democratic platform, where we said early, some of these channels are going to fail and some are going to be successful. Um, but the good news is we've already got 800 million people coming every month. There is an audience and if you've got great creative talent, you're going to be able to delight your audience. And then our job as, uh, on the monetization side is to help Peter and his brands get connected to the ones 
that are going to be successful. And the nice thing is in the internet space, we get instant feedback, right? We know really fast what's going to work and what's not going to work, and we can help connect those dots. So, so in that, it reminds me of uh, a, a, a very old, famous Milton Berle joke from, from the 60s when the Vietnam War was going on, and he had a show on television. And he was sitting on The Tonight Show, and he looked at Johnny Carson, and he said, I know how you solve the problems in Vietnam. I know how we can end the Vietnam War. And Johnny Carson looked at him and said, how's that? He said, put it on ABC. It'll be over in 13 weeks. <laughs> so um, exactly. there's a joke there, guys, I, pro I promise. Um, Rob, don't go there, please. <laughs> I was worrying about the other Milton Bell joke. That you told me. <laughs> and I was so hoping you were going to go there. But. <laughs> I promised I'd keep it relatively clean. But, but, but to that end, Alan, as you're, as you're looking at it, do you think there's a difference between the YouTube viewer? I mean, do you define a YouTube viewer different than you would a general market you know, television viewer? I mean, do you, do you program differently as you're thinking about it? Well, I, I think we kind of think about it in, in, in somewhat in a unique way for the internet and also really taking a lot of the learnings that the great broadcasters and the great you know, cable networks have really done in terms of how they program. But I think one thing that's really interesting to me is that two of the big brands on YouTube, Vivo and Machinima, represent content categories that in linear television didn't do very well, right? MTV essentially kicked music videos off the air and, and G4's ratings are, you know, clearly not stellar. But one of the issues that that, that, that brings up is that every time you have a medium a shift in the platform, you actually end up with new programming categories that actually resonate in a different way. And we think that is because search and recommendations and the ability to be on demand for your, your content has a lot to do because a Modern Warfare fan may not be a World of Warcraft fan or a Lady Gaga fan may not be an Eminem fan, but you can actually pick and choose where you want to see the content, what content you want. You can segment the world the way you want it. So that actually creates a different dynamic, and Vivo and Machinima have created giant programming brands in categories that in linear television didn't really work that well. Um, l l let me turn again to the... Um, the origin of, of YouTube. The democratization we talked about was a promise to independent creators and to those people who didn't any longer have to go through, Anthony, what you went through with the gatekeepers. You know, in, 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 in when you started the CSI franchise, there were probably three people or four people that could have you know, said yes or no and given you, you know, or, the light of one. day. Or one. <laughs> and and when, when we all talked about the early days, the user-generated content marketplace was promised for those independent and, and you know, non-professionals who had the talent. Having Anthony Zyker on, on are, are, we, are we closing the door again to the independent you know, user-generated? Because while I, I've always said user-generated is a misnomer, you're a user and you're generating it, so I think that qualifies. But does this mean now that the user-generated folks are gonna have to find another channel or? Well, no, I mean, it's, 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 it's the complete opposite. I mean, I, I'm here because of what I've learned from the user-generated content of people that have put stuff on YouTube that has inspired me. You know, the, we have a very talented country that we live in. And just because people don't live or make money in Hollywood doesn't mean they're not astronomically talented. Some of the best pieces of content I've ever witnessed has been on YouTube. So I respect that creator, whether that's a six-year-old with a camera, or whether it's a 35-year-old with a with a, you know, a professional camera, but I respect that content and it inspires me. And I think it's the opposite, meaning that when we do professional content on specific channels on YouTube and understand the relationship between the viewer and the user going back and forth, invariably their talents and comments are going to influence what we do in a very symmetrical relationship between the person that watches our videos and what comes out of us creatively. And it's a great, great partnership going forward. So it's good news for the independent. Absolutely, we, we, are, we are embracing the, the person that's not in the business and looking to them as a source of inspiration because we're only here because of them. And that's why we're on the stage. Great, thank you. Um, Peter, I wanna, I wanna flip back to you. We, you know, having a background myself on the agency side, I know that um, people struggled early in, in different iterations when radio became television and table, television became cable and whatnot, and, and the creation of content in a different way for different platforms. As a marketer, um, do you have preference? Do you see this platform requiring 
content creation in a different way to communicate marketing messages, or is it just reformat something you've already done? So uh, I've been thinking a lot about that, actually, and been spending a lot of time talking just in the last couple of days. Uh, we kind of do both things. We, we've created original content that we put up and run today. We also leverage existing commercials. And what's really interesting is consumers have sort of told us what they like and what they don't like because it's just in the sheer number of views. You can have one commercial on YouTube get 8 million views. Clearly something is working there. And you can have others that get 500,000 views. So what can you learn from that? Uh, this past holiday, we produced, uh, it's kind of a flash mob type execution but we didn't do it in the traditional way. It was actual content. We actually engineered it and produced it for really viewing on YouTube. But we brought in a director from Glee that brought much more life and, uh, and really put more uh, robust spin to what we were trying to do. And we were able to generate just on, on a four minute piece, four, almost five million views in a matter of three weeks. And if you look at the total video strategy we had, we had 26 million views before the Christmas season of that across all of our multi-platforms. So content is so, so important. And I think you have to kind of look at both sides of it and figure out what's actually appropriate and, and, and works in the space and in the environment. I've got to say that if you ever wanted proof of how fast the world is changing, you just heard a major advertiser use the words, we did a flash mob execution, but not in the traditional kind of way. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I, I, it's, it's stunning. I think that's fantastic. <laughs> that's true. That's funny. Touche. Uh, so, Rob, the least likely person I'd ask this question will be you, but that means I'm going to do it. Thank if you, you, Rob Norman, could launch one YouTube channel that didn't exist yet, what would it be? Oh, well, the, the, the impossibility of answering the question is that the likelihood of me being able to describe a channel that doesn't exist on YouTube is, is, is almost right. zero. Um, I, I, I that like, being said... Does, does, does the expression DIY mean anything in, in America? In, in our country, it's the thing you go to the Home Depot-like right. object yeah. for and you build things at home. I like DIY channels for women because I have a thing about women in tool belts. <laughs> <laughs> that would probably work really yeah. well. Let the record reflect, oh. he's taking me to a place yeah. I didn't want to go. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but, but, by the way, that's as close as I ever get to pitching Jaws in space. That's <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Lucas? Uh, I, I don't think I Because I'm at a loss for words now. Sure. I, need some <laughs> I, I don't think I have the comedic, uh, the comedic nature of Rob, but I have thought about it. and. Um, uh, you know, the, the one thing that, that's interesting about YouTube is it's basically creating, to Anthony's point, that he gets inspired uh, by creativity that comes from anywhere in the world. Um, and people that are passionate about the genres that he creates for are probably, uh, you know, it's easy for him to find those. Um, but as I think about it, uh, I, I always thought, I, I never, when my mom died, I never got to hear uh, her voice or have any video of her. And I've thought before my parents uh, passed away, I've always thought of just making a three minute video for each of them of sort of what's the lesson that they want to pass on to the world. And imagine, you know, think out 10 years, what if you had a video record of every human being that was on this planet uh, and they could share their wisdom back with the world? It might only be interesting to a few people each, uh, your family, but imagine being able to go back and look at your grandfather uh, and see what he was like, you know, 100 years later. So if you really think out uh, that we're six years, seven years old as YouTube, but think out 50 years from now. Think of the, the history and the, the world experiences that we're going to be able to capture. Um, and what if you could build a repository for it? So if, there, you know, if there's a channel idea in that, if somebody hasn't already done it, um, that's the one I would build. Do we have a sponsor out there for that? That's a, <laughs> I, I, I like it. Um, guys, we, we've talked about it, but we haven't talked about it specifically. That, that feedback loop and the data that, that, that is being created and, 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 and is, is, you know, um, being cataloged somewhere, and, and it's massive, and it's exciting, and it's also challenging and daunting. And forget the regulatory aspects of it, forget the privacy aspects of it, because that would be not only a session, but you know, uh, probably a lot longer to, to sort through. And, and believe me, if uh, I believe at least, if it wasn't an election year, it may be one of the biggest issues that we face as a, as a, as a world is, is the, the privacy and data issue, but let's talk about it as it relates to 
the programming and the content and, again, that feedback loop, who owns the data? Let's talk about it. I mean, Peter, you know, it's, it's, it's stuff that's, you know, mother's milk for you. You need to know for Rob as well as he advises clients on where to, where to invest the money. And for Alan and for Anthony, clearly, you know, should be directional as to where programming is being done and, and the kinds of things that they're creating. It has to be important in that process. Right. Who owns the data? I mean, anybody, Alan, I mean, what do you think first? Well, I mean, I think the thing that's really incredible about online video is that you, we can use it as programmers to help us understand what's going on. But even for our customers, the advertisers, we can really, without dealing with privacy issues, without violating anyone's privacy, really optimize campaigns based on the type of content that can be on YouTube. And this is where I think the UGC thing is an interesting question because if you think about just pure brand, the television model, really good shows get really good advertising. But for example, in, in our community, a Modern Warfare 3 video play, gameplay, that could never end up on television because the kids are swearing over it and it looks like gameplay, that content could convert at higher rates from a click-through rate to uh, you know, another gaming title or a movie title or even a technology product. So from an advertising side, I mean, the great thing about online video is you get the ability to have branding and you know, visuals and all the great things that you know, the Anthony's of the world have created, but you also get the, uh, the direct response and the metrics and the ability to really understand how to optimize conversion rate. I mean, after all, on television, you don't even know if the person's in the room when your ad's playing. Uh, in this case, you have to click on the ads, you have to, and, and you can actually help really uh, you know, generate higher click-through rates for the customer. And, and Peter, you know, again, it started, you know, down the road with you, and then I got distracted as usual and asked Alan the question. It was really your question, but what the hell? <laughs> so, you know, I was just going to say, you know, one of the pieces of the puzzle is, you know, it's just targeting ability for us as an advertiser is going to be far greater. I mean, we're actually, you already have a, a person who is opting in to, to, to view something. It's now our responsibility to ensure that whatever we're providing them to view is relevant content for them. Because I actually think that will close the loop even, even more so to a, to a direct sale type mechanism. And I think when you really start to get down to it, in, in the online environment, we can dynamically really figure this out on a much greater basis and apply some of the tactics that we're already using throughout the other parts of online and actually bring it to the video, uh, through video placement now. So I think it's actually be quite helpful to what we actually do. So I think about two sets of two. One is personally identifiable information and how very, very careful we need to be with that. And that's our responsibility in our world. I think there's corporately identifiable information as well. So the things that happen in Peter's world and the actions that people take in people's world shouldn't necessarily improve the targeting capabilities of one of his competitors. I think that's his to own. I also think that the data issue is a very different data issue if we think about it in terms of short-term marketing effect versus long-term marketing effect. And my personal belief is that one of the big maturation issues that YouTube and other forms of online media have got to go through is to be thinking about what their impact on the long-term effect of brands and marketing is rather than the short-term effect. And coming from a business like Google, which of course made many a fine dollar on the short-term effect as exemplified by last-click attribution, I think that's a sea change in the way we need to think about the way we use data. Absolutely. And, and, and Lucas, um, if, if there was a parting shot to, to, to the marketplace in terms of the excitement of, of, of this launch and, and, and of these channels and of what is truly, I believe, game-changing for content and distribution and marketing all coming together in an interesting and exciting way. Um, have you learned anything this week at CES from an electronic standpoint, from a technology standpoint, from what the marketers are saying, what's your big takeaway? Uh, you know, looking at all the pieces of the puzzle as 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 you're now, you know, responsible for helping put it all together. Sure. Uh, you know, you and I have the same 300 cable TV channels on our box, and the, you probably watch 20, and I watch 20, but they're not the same 20, and we all, both have 280 that aren't that relevant for us. Um, and I, I just can't help but think about the fact that the channels I have on my YouTube guide and the channels that you have uh, will each be the 20 that you're most passionate about. 
And uh, when you then are able to say to a, a brand builder and an advertising partner, uh, we've got 800 million people who their channels are they're passionate, they're individualized for them, and the audience is really engaged. Uh, there's a gamer that loves Mishimina, um, uh, or somebody loves horror and sci-fi that's watching Black Box. Um, we have this really engaged audience, and then the power of the internet and the power of Google, not just YouTube, but from Google Plus and to search and to uh, Chrome and Gmail, all these things, to put it all together to be able to serve uh, the right message at the right time to a really passionate and engaged person where it seems relevant and almost delightful, uh, you walk away going, we might be really close to it. It's all, not all perfect today, but the chance to make brand building far more impactful and effective uh, and also delightful for users and complementary to the, the create, creative and the arts of uh, the entertainment world, um, it's probably never been a better time to be a brand builder or a creator of content. Um, well, and that's what's exciting. Well, on that note, I'd like to thank Anthony Zeicher, Alan Debevoil, Lucas Watson, Rob Norman, Peter DeLuca, and of course a shout out for Robert Kinsel who got us started here today. And I'd like to thank all of you for spending some time and wish you a great week and a great 2012. Thank you.